started, um, I wanted to begin this afternoon with just a couple of announcements so that none of you who are planning to party with the president would be confused. Um, this evening from 9.30 to 10.30 uh, is my conference on the couch uh, up in my presidential palace. And um, there's a situation with the elevator because we're on some kind of lockdown on the 23rd floor because we're all so special up there. Um, there you can't use your key, uh, key to go up. You, you don't need a key to go up there unless you're in elevator three. All the other elevators, even though they say that the 23rd floor is off limits without a key to, to put in, it's, uh, it's not the case. Only in elevator three. But there will be someone positioned downstairs from the hotel who will help you come up to the 23rd floor um, whenever you want to do it between 9.30 and about quarter till 11 this evening if you want to come to conference on the couch. And that will also be true uh, for our, for any of those of you who are here this afternoon for our meeting, our curriculum meeting at seven o'clock in the morning on Saturday, which is also upstairs in, in my quarters. <laughs> okay, it's 2314, 2314, yep, 2314, okay. And, uh, and that also goes for after the croning, there'll be a little gathering up there too for the cronets and the new cronies and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, lots of, this is, we party in the presidential palace because you know you are the ones who are paying for it, so I'm opening up my presidential palace to my people. <laughs> yeah, the, the, okay, yeah. That, all right. All right. One of the presidential perks is the happy task of choosing an esteemed someone to speak before the AFS body on a topic relevant to folklore. Because our theme for this meeting centers on unfinished stories, I thought to ask the question, a vital one I think, for folklore and folklorists in the 21st century, what is the value of an old story? How is that value communicated through recursions, repetitions, and remakings? Put differently, nobody knows the past that awaits, but lasting stories and the diverse ways in which they are performed and reperformed over time open portals to the past and to the future. Our 2016 presidential plenary speaker, Carolyn Dinshaw, is a renowned scholar of old, old stories. And she is also an old friend of mine. Trained as a medievalist specializing in Middle Engli English and well known for her early feminist takes on, Ch on Chaucer, she has a great fondness for folklore as well. Her accomplishments are many and they range across disciplinary boundaries. Importantly, she is the founding editor with David Halperin of GLQ, the go-to gay and lesbian quarterly. Her eloquent theorizing of queer temporalities is without peer. She has been called by her own colleagues the poet of her profession. She possesses musical gifts that seep into her philosophical writing and resonate beyond generic limits. I think you'll feel that resonance in her presentation today. Carolyn Dinshaw is Julius Silver, Rosalind S. Silver, and Enid Silver Winslow, professor at New York University, where she is jointly appointed in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis and English. Before she came to NYU, she taught from 1982 to 1999 at the University of California at Berkeley. Upon moving to NYU, she founded the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality and served as its director from 1999 to 2005. She is the author of How Soon Is Now, Medieval Texts, Amateur Readers, and the Queerness of Time from 2012. Also the author of the very important text, Getting Medieval, Sexualities and Communities, Pre and Postmodern from 1999. And she also wrote the first full length feminist study of Chaucer, Chaucer's Sexual Politics. 
Recent notes and essays from Carolyn include response time, linear, nonlinear, queer, and another one called Nostalgia on My Mind. There's no one that you'll want to think about time with better than Carolyn Dinshaw. Dinshaw is the recent past president of the New Chaucer Society, and in the classroom, she regularly teaches materials past and present in courses ranging from medieval misogyny to queer New York City. She is a former member and the only other member, along with me, of the rock duet Snaggletooth. Sister. I can't exaggerate enough my sense of the importance of Carolyn's work for folklore and our work for hers. As she herself says inimitably, quote, the material and the immaterial, the real and the fictional, the present and the past are porous. A world in which everyday time is itself experienced as wondrous and the present unmasterable is full of other times and always already very full, unquote. How pleased I am to introduce Carolyn to you as she gives us a new spin on an old story in her lecture, Rip Van Winkle in the East Village, Queer Times in Stories, Stories in Queer Times. Help me welcome Carolyn Dinshaw. Thank you so much, Kay, for that generous introduction. It's been a very welcoming conference for me so far. Um, I do want to thank Tim Lloyd and Michael and all the tech help um, for um, setting up today and easing my passage into the conference. Um, I want to encourage people to, to move forward. There are a lot of tweets uh, toward the front. Uh, as, as Kay mentioned, I have some video that I will be screening, and, and it's quite small. So um, I, I urge you to, to move forward. All right. One person is obeying my plea. Uh, okay, here come more. Wonderful. We can begin. On seven nights in the summer of 1986, a strapping performer with a strange name and a face thick with makeup put on a show in New York. It was a dramatization of Washington Irving's classic story, Rip Van Winkle, and the performer was Ethel Eichelberger who wrote the script and played all the roles, Rip himself, wife Dame Van Winkle, and daughter Judith. On a tiny stage upstairs at Performance Space 122, a popular venue for queer artists in New York's East Village, Eichelberger, beneath a hand-painted proscenium arch, wore a costume looking like something between a clown and a bumblebee. throwing an apron over it when playing the dame. He declaimed his lines in a fake Dutch accent, sang at the piano, tap danced, donned an accordion, despite the entanglements of his very long beard, wrangled a live dog on stage, and generally romped his way through this piece of cherished Americana. Eichelberger was well known to his audience by the time of those hot July nights, having lived and performed in New York for over a decade. After years of refining his acting craft 
in a repertory theater in Providence, Rhode Island, he moved to downtown New York in the 1970s with its vertiginous mix of high and low art, thrilling ex aesthetic experiments, and wild improvisations in media and form, not to mention whacked out crossings of genders and sexualities. Eichelberger joined the legendary Ridiculous Theatrical Company. A theater critic called his performance style with that troupe utterly disciplined preposterousness. After a few years with the Ridiculous, he set out on his own, eventually to create about 30 roles for himself, mostly female, but some male, like Rip, like King Lear, which he spelled L-E-E-R. These were roles based on classical, mythical, and historical figures, in addition to classically canonical theater figures. There was Nefertiti, there's Lucretia Borza, Clytemnestra, Carlotta, Empress of Mexico, Elizabeth I. Playing Rip Van Winkle, Eichelberger was fresh from a run in his play Casanova, and he would turn after Rip to a production of his own St. Joan thereafter. Eichelberger was a performer who called himself a storyteller. I'm just looking for a story to tell, he explained to a critic, and I want to do grand characters. Grand was indeed what he did. Medea, Clytemnestra, Nefertiti, King Lear, yes, those are very big stories with outsized characters. But why then Rip Van Winkle, a comic short story, enduringly famous, but mostly good for a laugh? Why would a notorious downtown performer with shaved eyebrows, closely cropped scalp, and a full back tattoo, an artist schooled in the theater of the ridiculous, a tragedian who acted with plaintive rec grandeur, as a New York Times critic put it, a drag queen immersed in vaudeville and burlesque who not only held the theatrical stage, but also danced on the bar at the infamous Pyramid Club. Why would Ethel Eichelberger in 1986 choose this tale? I want to explore with you today what this traditional story offered then and offers still. Rip Van Winkle's weird experience opens up other queer ways of being not tied to ordinary expectations of time. So this talk this afternoon is in three parts. Part one, Washington Irving's Rip Van Winkle. Washington Irving's short story, first published in 1819, is such a classic that the name Rip Van Winkle dots the American landscape. There's the Rip Van Winkle Bridge in upstate New York, plus more motels than I can count. There's a famous bourbon distillery. The mattress I sleep on is, yes, a Rip Van Winkle. The name evokes deep sleep and strange dreams, supernatural happenings, and bewildering change. You undoubtedly know the basics of the narrative, but let me remind you of the tale's general outline. I've written about this tale in my book, How Soon Is Now, and I will be drawing on that treatment here. Rip Van Winkle lives in a village on the Hudson River in New York and roams happily throughout the mountainous area. Beloved of his fellow villagers, he shirks familial duties and his wife's nagging to wander, to play, and to attend to any other household's needs but his own. Walking deep into the woods one afternoon, he indulges his passion for squ shooting squirrels, thus successfully avoiding Dame Van Winkle and his own domestic obligations. As evening starts to fall on his little hunting adventure, Rip hears his name cried out in the twilight air. He sees a stranger dressed quaintly, carrying a keg up a steep mountainside. He helps this old man of the glen, and together they approach a company of odd-looking personages playing at ninepin. The group is solemn and mysterious, and Rip is puzzled by it. 
The short and stocky characters partake of the liquor of the keg, and so does Rip, whose senses are gradually overpowered. He wakes up in the morning, stiff in the joints, to find his dog gone, his gun oddly aged, and his beard grown a foot long. Making his way down the mountain, Rip notes inexplicable differences in the landscape and finally reaches his village, but he recognizes almost nothing of it, and no one in turn recognizes him. Finally, though, he encounters his own daughter and her son, named Rip as well, and they slowly piece it all together. He has been gone for 20 years and has slept through the revolution. It hardly seems to Rip to have made much of a difference, however. Things seem more or less the same. But the death of his wife is news that brings him joy, and Rip, the fittingness of whom's name should now be clear, settles back into life around a two-decade lapse. He can finally prosper in his own way as the bachelor, idle and revered, he always psychically was. Washington Irving read, used, and was deeply immersed in old folk tales in the composition of his famous story, though he was hardly straightforward about his debt to them. He created a crafty narrative frame. After an epigraph, he introduces the tale in the voice of his narrative persona, Geoffrey Crayon, by saying it was found posthumous, posthumously among the papers of one Dietrich Knickerbocker, a gentleman much interested in the Dutch history of New York. Knickerbocker is yet another one of Irving's narrative personae. And after the tale, in a note appended to Rip Van Winkle's story, he, that is Jeffrey Crayon, coyly remarks that you might have thought Knickerbocker was influenced by an old legend, the German superstition about the Emperor Frederick der Rotbart and the Kyffhäuser Mountain. But no, Knickerbocker got it from Rip Van Winkle himself, and the account was even notarized by a country justice. Irving thus gestures toward the realm of folktale, his real source, but then takes it back and insists on the actual historicity, um, the absolute veracity of the event. As I hope will become clear in a moment, I think both folktale and truthful event are in play here. For traditional stories have the power to reveal realities of life that are often felt but have not been attested by a scientific measurement or fact-checked histories. Irving drew on a range of traditional stories, in fact, in order to explore the lived reality of time itself. You may or may not recall the legend of Frederick Barbarossa, Emperor Frederick der Rotbart. In it, the emperor is buried in a hill, deep in a magical sleep, but he's expected to return at some point in the future, in the distant future. Such magical sleep is in fact a well-known motif, tail type 766 in the Ahn Thompson tail type index. I just earned my honorarium. Um, <laughs> Frederick Barbarossa is the most prominent medieval example of this motif, but King Arthur too, in folklore versions, lies buried under the hills, and other rulers also populate stories of subterranean dormition. The relevance of the legend of Frederick Barbarossa to Rip Van Winkle is clear, and Irving was no doubt reading this tale when composing his story. But, and here's Irving's wiliness in operation, it's the previous tale in the collection of legends that he was using that proves the most similar to R Irving's Rip Van Winkle narrative. According to Irving scholars, including John Thorne of the New York Folklore Association, the legend of Peter Klaus, the goat herd, the legend that preceded the legend of Frederick Barbarossa in Ottmar's Volkersagen, which Irving was using, is Irving's indubitable source, Peter Klaus. The resemblance is indeed overwhelming. A goat herd, Peter Klaus, follows a mysterious guide to Kipphäuser Mountain, witnesses a game of nine pins, drinks a potion, and wakes 20 years later. Further back in Irving's mind was the tale of Thomas Reimer, 
known to him most likely via Sir Walter Scott, wherein Thomas, the rhymer, dreams of a fairy queen and travels with her to an other world. He thinks he remains there for three days, but has actually been there for three years or more. These tales are what I have called tales of asynchrony, and they are ubiquitous. They are found in a wide range of contexts, ancient and modern, in natural histories, in sermons, in hagiographies, historical writings, folk tales, fables. A monk wanders out of the cloister very early one day, only to return mid-morning, centuries later. Seven men remain somnolent as around them paganism is defeated and Christianity triumphs. A youngster sets out to bring a sheep from a farm back to town, turns off the road to take a nap in a cave, and wakes decades later. Only when told of his wonder, wondrous sleep does he then age marvelously, marvelously rapidly, but he also goes on to live almost another century. Irving knew of these tales, and the genius of these traditional stories, the reason that Irving could draw on them and insist at the same time that his is an historically accurate event, is that the reason that Irving could do these, um, both these things, is that they respond to the felt human sense that time doesn't always pass at the same tempo, minute after measurable minute, the present leaving the past behind and moving toward a bright new future. Despite our ordinary Im image of time, linear time, clock time, one moment succeeding the last in an always even and one way flow, we often experience time differently. Classical philosopher Simplicius, commenting on Aristotle, observed that when we sleep undisturbed or when we are engrossed in intense thought or action, as he puts it, we think that no time has intervened, even though often a long time has passed. Conversely, says Simplicius, one can see it also from the opposite case, since people in pain and distress or in need and want, thinking that such a change is great, think th that the time also is great. Time is lived. It's full of attachments and desires, histories and futures. It's not a hollow form that is the same always. And this is exactly what Irving explores in his famous story. Overnight, it seems, Rip Van Winkle has become a walking anachronism. Everything, including his own body, has aged considerably, but in his mind, he's aware of only one night's passing. His experience was not a dream, though it has a dreamlike, figural, asynchronous quality because a marvelously long time has in fact passed, 20 years, and the details of the spirit's visit will be eventually corroborated by his friend, Peter Vanderdonk. Rip himself has a two decade long temporal gap in his own life. He's the very embodiment of temporal asynchrony. And the story Rip Van Winkle expresses the constant pressure of other temporalities on our own ordinary image of time. It is, in the, it is, in this sense, realistic. Such incredible realism perhaps explains why Rip Van Winkle was immediately taken seriously in the region of upstate New York itself. The supernatural stratum of the narrative brings out the queer potential of everyday time, what I, following critical theorist Ernst Bloch, refer to as the non-contemporaneity of the now. The ghost of Hendrik Hudson, the first discoverer of the river and country, and his crew reappear in the Catskill Mountains every 20 years with the regularity that ironically heightens the asynchrony of their ghostly presence. Spirits, ghosts, specters and apparitions, gods and the divine, the supernatural can erupt in any moment, refusing to let us forget the unsettling, wondrous, scary asynchrony of life that the imperative of scientific temporal measurement would lead us to dis discount. It is just that queer potential of the everyday, its capacity to host such revenants that Ethel Eichelberger's play Rip Van Winkle so giddily exploits. 
part two, Ethel Eichelberger's Rip Van Winkle. Ethel Eichelberger had an encyclopedic knowledge of American theater traditions, as a contemporary critic Neil Bartlett noted, and a keen sense of ghosts, ghosts of old vaudevillians, black-faced actors, actors in drag. One such ghost haunting his production of Rip Van Winkle may well have been Joseph Jefferson, an American actor of the 19th century whose name is almost synonymous with Rip's. Jefferson, a struggling actor in the late 1850s, came upon the idea of playing the part of Rip when he was reading a biography of Washington Irving. Even before he wrote the play, he started getting his costume together, so possessed by the character was he. And once he started performing the part, performing, the part absolutely took hold of him. He played Rip for 40 years, Rip and virtually nothing else. Rip all over the US and Europe as well, even Australia. Jefferson was fascinated by the psychological aspects of the situation, by what could happen to you and those around you if time indeed passed in such a queer way. Jefferson's utter commitment to this play, to the theatricality of this drama, so that he even presented several scenes in the new medium of film in 1896, his commitment would not have been lost on Eichelberger, whose utter commitment to performance was legendary even in his own lifetime. Here I want to stop to acknowledge my guide to all things Ethel Eichelberger, including the connection that I just mentioned to Joseph Jefferson. That guide is the meticulous and invaluable PhD dissertation by Joe E. Jeffries called an outre entree into the pararidiculous histrionics of drag diva Ethel Eichelberger, a true story. I have to say, Joe has also been personally very gracious and generous with his res resources as well. So Eichelberger, as Joe Jeffries demonstrates, delivered the total theatrical experience, declaiming, speaking in dialect, engaging in stage business, producing special effects, dancing, singing with self-accompaniment on accordion and piano until he just couldn't sing anymore, and only then, after three encore songs following Rip Van Winkle leaving the stage. Here's my first video. I also want to mention Nelson Sullivan, who uh, shot the video from um, which I've taken so many stills. Okay, so that was Ethel Eichelberger after a long performance of Rip Van Winkle and three encores. And though he created 30 odd roles for himself, Eichelberger was deeply invested in those characters, every one of them, in Phaedra, for example, whom he played Jeffrey. Um, Joseph Jefferson-like for upwards of 30 years. Now, Joseph Jefferson's Rip Van Winkle, here's the play script, extends the dramatic action into four acts with added characters and subplots and a very altered ending in which the termagant, Dame Van Winkle, not only lives but is chastened and reunited with Rip in a sentimental Victorian triumph of marriage and family. 
Eichelberger's version, in contrast, hews closely to many uh, aspects of Irving's story, carefully adapting Irving's language at many points, and even maintaining the fictional frame, that is, that Dietrich Knickerbocker wrote down the story and then Irving published it. But Eichelberger does elaborate and embellish Irving's fairly stark narrative and gives voice at great length to Dame Van Winkle, who doesn't get her own voice in Irving's narrative. Eichelberger also invents very animated dialogue between Rip and his wife, which he performs in two different vocal registers with a quick shift of the body as wife berates husband and husband responds with blandishments. In this clip, Dame Van Winkle accuses Rip of leading the village youth astray and banishes both her husband and his beloved dog. that if they laugh, 
then that gives me a chance to go on and perform. He's chosen this story about ghosts who themselves are engaged in a solemn game of nine pins, gravely amusing themselves in the most mysterious silence, as Irving puts it. And as I see it, these ghosts of Hendrik Hudson and his crew, it is those ghosts that leads to the essence of Eichelberger's seriousness. Hendrik Hudson is played by Eichelberger's former colleague at their ridiculous theatrical company, Katie Dearlum, a 500-pound performer who, according to an account of another production, understood what Eichelberger was up to better than any other performer. After Rip sings a song at the piano and then plans to take a nap, Hendrik suddenly appears in a diaphanous white gown on a video screen off to the side of the stage. Dear Lump is the video ghost of a ghost, and 
there are, I want to say, many more ghosts conjured by that video. I suspect that the video footage, like the short film Eichel Berger screened immediately after Rip Van Winkle at Performance Space 122, was shot by photographer Peter Kujar. Kujar was a well-known downtown artist, one of Andy Warhol's 13 Most Beautiful Boys, with whom Eichel Berger collaborated over many years. I showed this slide earlier of his portrait of Eichel Berger's tattoo. Kujar himself was fast becoming a ghost at the very moment of this performance. He died of AIDS-related illness the year after Rip Van Winkle was performed. Eichelberger was at his hospital bedside. Ghosts, indeed, were walking the streets of the East Village. A staggering number of Eichelberger's closest friends, artistic muses, and genius inspirations were sick and dying at that time as AIDS ravaged New York City, and in particular, the downtown neighborhoods where Eichelberger worked and lived. Charles Ludlum, the great genius of my life, as Eichelberger said of him, founder of the Ridiculous Theatrical Company, died the next year as well. Jack Smith, the notorious experimental filmmaker, was dying, as was Eichelberger's roommate. Already dead was that roommate's boyfriend. A whole generation of artists was being wiped out, and it, as that mass death experience, as Sarah Shulman put it, occurred, quote, the experimentalism, the erotic sophistication, the prejudice against materialism, the elusive humor, the ambition to measure up to international and timeless standards, above all the belief that art should be serious and difficult, all this rich, ambiguous mixture of values and ideas evaporated, unquote, wrote writer Edmund, Edmund White. Clubs closed, rents went up, businesses were shuttered. Enormous changes were in process in the East Village, changes abetted by the greed of the art market, the depredations of real estate developers, and the bland, phobic pity of mainstream artists and entertainers. And ghosts in the village played, as it were, at nine pins. My material is dealing with politics in the terms of our lives, the lives of people I know, said Eichelberger to playwright Neil Bartlett. In 1988, Eichelberger put on a show called Fiasco that was more openly about AIDS losses than any other work of his had been. In it, the AIDS dead, among them notable artists Divine and Charles Ludlum, gather around a dinner table and then create a performance dedicated to Jack Smith. But in 1986, Eichelberger's Rip Van Winkle too addressed the devastation. It is about haunting, about the persistence of the dead, about the eruption of the past and its denizens into, denizens into our present moment. It's also about political disappointment or disillusionment. A revolution? Asked the newly awakened Rip when his daughter mentions the many things he has missed in the past 20 years. Who won? We did, she responds. You are now a free citizen of the United States. Hooray, cries Rip. No taxes, no taxes. Free rent. I wouldn't go that far, remarks Judith dryly. And Eichelberger's audience laughed. Knowingly, I'd say. Drastic changes were taking place, but they still paid rent. They were still required to pay taxes. Even more than ever, in 1986, there was taxation, but no representation. The president, Ronald Reagan, had barely uttered the word AIDS, and more and more people were dying. That is why Rip Van Winkle was needed in the East Village in the dog days of summer in 1986. Traditional stories reveal to us dimensions of life that are not progressive, not modern, that are connected to the past, that are peopled by ghosts and spirits. They invite us to experience the reality of time that doesn't flow only in one direction. Like Rip, whose mind has not experienced the passage of time but whose body has, we are all walking anachronisms, connected to and even inhabited by other times other places, other people. And we can thus create and nurture communities across time, communities that are queer, because they flout ordinary assumptions about time and insist on other ways of being that cross past and present life and death. Ethel Eichelberger, HIV positive and facing the inevitable decline of his health, killed himself 
Space 122, the queer space where he staged Rip and many other shows, is gently haunted by his spirit. Part three, Kestutis Magas, Rip, a performance. The haunting sense of time passed and a landscape changed beyond recognition conjured up Rip Van Winkle again in a performance in the East Village just this past summer, almost 30 years to the day after Eichelberger's Rip. Once again, the traditional story opened up a deeper understanding of the nature of time. In the words of this recent show, the story managed to rip time's curtain, rip time's curtain down, exposing the eternal now. Playwright Kestutis Nakas, who back in the day presented, quote, punk Elizabethan extravagances that were both artistically lavish and aggressively non-commercial, unquote, at the Pyramid Club where Eichelberger danced on bar. Kestutis Nakas entitled this show, Rip, a performance. The title character's name stands for Rest in Peace. The performance took place as part of the Howell Festival in the Howell Arts Gallery in the East Village, surrounded now by new luxury condos and upscale shops. Nakas dressed in a costume that gestured to the old Dutch and spoke in a rhyming verse form that imparted a traditional flavor to his dramatic narrative poem. He calls this verse form iambic, iambic fontameter. His rip is an inhabitant of New Amsterdam with girlfriend problems. To avoid turmoil in the household, he wanders through the city and one day stumbles into the paradise that was the East Village in the 1980s. Hailed by some guys unloading barrels from an ancient psychedelic van, he helps get swept into the infamous Pyramid Club and finds a beautifully compatible space there, a home away from his trouble. There, he tells stories of old New York. He experiences a communion with the crowd. He reaches a climax, and then he passes out, falling through the floor into a space-time wormhole. When he awakens, he finds himself in Tom's, Tompkins Square Park, a park in the middle of the East Village, with a long beard and his dog, Lifeless, at his feet. Everything has changed. All the old clubs, galleries, bars are gone and unrecognizable people walk around holding small rectangles to their ears. <laughs> Enumerating all the elements of this altered landscape, from the lost spaces to the lost people, Nakas weaves a tale that is part Washington Irving, part personal autobiography, part collective neighborhood memory. His idea for the performance came to him, he said, when he returned to the East Village last fall after 26 years away. Witnessing the radically changed landscape, recognizing nothing and no one, he felt, he said, like Rip Van Winkle. There's a powerful sense of loss in his performance, a lamentation for a whole world, explicitly including Ethel Eichelberger and all of his ilk. But there's a glimpse of redemption, too, after the full force of loss is felt. The old talent stars of the Pyramid Club are gone, yes. The brilliant artists of the East Village have passed. But new stars are born, and through them the spirit of the lost scene lives. In a luminous gesture of generosity and, and wisdom, on the night I attended, Nakas opened his stage to a young performer to shine. The vocalist Joseph Keckler sang a comic opera aria of love and loss, telling of a romantic betrayal that was both classic and very contemporary, the lover's faithlessness discovered via phones and texts and GPS. It was fun of the most serious sort, Eichelberger-esque in that way. Keckler's gorgeous, crazy aria ended in a haunting, muted, high-pitched, high-pitched, Was it Ethel Eichelberger himself? That is what I heard on that summer night in the East Village, a village that is part of a very full world, peopled with beings across time, across death. It was
much and we'll be a very clear now. Thank you, Carolyn. That was some respondents and we'll have a bit of a conversation um, as well I hope uh, with Carl Lindahl, Christina Bachelega and Solimar Otero coming up to respond and yeah why don't we all gather around Carol and not leave her stranded in the world of rip. <laughs> Let, let me introduce uh, Carl Lindahl. Um, I know all of you know him. Um, he's uh, a folklorist who's taught at the University of Houston for a number of years, has done incredibly important work. Um, the thing about Carl, though, is that he has some training uh, early on in, uh, in medievalism. He knew Carolyn for a moment uh, back in the 80s. Um, uh, when he was still attending uh, Chaucer conferences. So I thought it would be really fun for Carl to respond to, to Carolyn today. Carl Lindahl. Dutch of the Dutch colonist whose time had clearly passed, Irving's story had a visceral impact on his first readers. Only by following a hole through time can Rip ignore it, and only his desire to live a dream more torpid than sleep itself can be satisfied by having missed what he has missed. In the Eichelberger 
and Nakas versions, the hero sleeps not through civic triumphs, but through immeasurable, unnumbered losses to AIDS. This flip causes Eichelberger to pose different questions. Who wouldn't want to sleep dreamlessly through such a nightmare? But finally, how can we? The Reagan administration did indeed sleep through it, and the cost was too great. Eichelberger's rip dreams of waking, restoring life, not enshrining sleep. Carolyn Dinshaw spoke of more heroic figures from our folkloric past whose sleep defies time. And in their stories, we find a similar modulation between frozen fantasy on the one hand and the what if of legend on the other. We may treat the story of King Arthur, Britain's longest and most celebrated sleeper, as a distant Markinesque fantasy or as something that hits us with a present sense of possibility, we can seriously ask about this story, what if? Most of Mallory's Mort Arthur is copied closely from sources committed to writing more than two centuries before, and we detect a sense of distance fantasy in much of his translation. But when he comes to the passage of Arthur's death, he breaks away from those sources and speaks with direct in sudden passion, both from and to his own times and personal beliefs. Uh, Mallory writes, yet some men say in many parts of England that King Arthur is not dead, but had by the will of our Lord Jesu into another place. And men say that he shall come again and shall win the Holy Cross. Yet I will not say that it shall be so, but rather I would say here in this world, he changed his life. He went away as all of us mortals do. Whenever and wherever Arthur's story begins us, uh, to take us so forcibly back to the here and now, it is unfolding at least as soon as now. A living legend demands what if, and that is exactly what Irving in his time and Eichelberger and Nakas nearly 200 years later have infused in their various versions. The second point, the now potentiality of legend comes hand in hand with its penchant for here. It is the business of both Carolyn Dinshaw and the legend to ask how soon is now, but note that both equally address the question of how, how close is here. Jakob Grimm noted that though American may soar to places we've never seen, legend comes to us. The legend walks knocks at our door, he famously said. Legend builds its home, welcome or not, inside our own world. The late Bill Nicolaisen liked to remind us that if American is about once upon a time, then the legend is all about once upon a place. Carolyn asks uh, about how beautifully, uh, uh, Carolyn speaks about how beautifully Irving nailed his setting. His portrait of the Catskills and their Dutch inhabitants was immediately taken seriously by his Hudson Valley readers, who seemed to have sensed that something in their world was out of step with standard time. In moving Irving's story to the mouth of the Hudson and then into the East Village, Nakas is dragging an anachronistic place into a happening place, transforming the East Village for a short time into a wild suburb of the countryside. But as the sleepiness of the Catskills is progressively overpowered by the sleeplessness of the East Village, we no longer have to ask how close is here. We in the legend have arrived here together. A third and final thing, Irving and Eichelberger were compulsive storytellers. Their stories were their lives, we might say without much exaggeration, and Carolyn has taken upon herself to tell their stories. I believe that part of the impulse for all three of them, as for me, is our shared recognition that those who do not tell their stories are condemned to become the victims of them. No one who has listened long to Irish and Scottish narratives in recent times is likely to have missed hearing one or another version of my favorite queer time tale, The Man Who Had No Story. The one version that now seems to be seizing Europe was little known a few decades back, and to my knowledge published only once. But last November in Göttingen, the home of the 
the home of the Grimm's, I heard the great Portuguese scholar Isabel Cardigos tell it, and she was searching for a copy. She did not know if it had ever been written down before, but someone had told her that the late Duncan Williamson, the master traveler tale teller, was the man who told the woman, who told the man that told Isabel that story. Duncan told it as a true episode from his life, and this is a very short summary. When he was a young man, he worked a lot on farms. He once landed up in the north of Scotland where a farmer gave him a year's work. Come harvest, there was a Cayley, and everyone was telling stories, but he couldn't do anything like that. After everyone had done, the host farmer says to him, look, do you not think it's time that you told yours? I can't tell stories. Well, in that case, do you mind doing me a wee forfeit? So go down to the old boat on the shore right outside the house and bring back the bailer from inside it. When he got to the boat, he tripped, fell, and hurt his head, and finally awakened in the middle of the water with the boat floating freely in the middle of the night. He was shocked and out of thoughts. To calm himself, he reached for his pipe, but in feeling for his shirt pocket, he ran his hand over a big round lump, and then he felt the same thing over his other pocket. And instead of trousers, he was wearing a skirt. Uh, and the something under the skirt he used to have was gone. And in his place was something else. Uh, and this is the diction which was used in Scotland, very delicate. Uh, she, he passed out again and came conscious when the boat ran aground on a strange shore. A young man finds her and takes her into his big fine house. As the months pass, the host falls in love with the girl from the boat and they marry. They have two children and one day after the younger turns seven, they go down to the shore and run across the boat that had borne her to her husband. A storm comes up at that moment and the husband uh, leaves her under a tree while he runs home to an umbrella, but she, to get an umbrella for her. But she walks compulsively toward that old boat and then falls on her head and loses consciousness. She, she awoke in the dark on the water and smelled something funny. It was sheep dip in her clothes, coarse man's clothes. Her chest was flat as a pancake. Oh, this is terrible. What about my man and my kids? Finally, her boat or his boat reached shore and he saw on the land of the house where everyone but him was telling stories. He went back in, gave the host the bailer, and saw that the whole company he left behind all those years before was still telling stories. You're never going to believe what happened to me, he told his host, and he narrated everything that had happened since he left. The farmer said, you did all that in 20 minutes? That's all the time that's passed since you went to the boat. When I asked you to tell a story, you couldn't do it at all. Next time you're asked to tell a story, you'll have a story to tell. So, if you do not have a story, you become its victim. The only way not to be owned by your story is to tell it. The owner of this story may seem the least likely to have told the queerest version of the tale type yet recorded by anyone I know. But Duncan was, after all, one of the travelers the nomadic Scots, long persecuted and mocked by their countrymen. Folklorists today recognize that everyone can be of a folk, that everyone participates in lore, but I hold with the number of my predecessors and my contemporaries who locate the primary work of folklorists as well as the greatest wealth of the folk themselves among marginalized groups, groups that Diane Goldstein and Amy Schumann identify as the stigmatized vernacular, graduates of what Dory Noyes calls hard scrabble academies, people caught within, uh, within what I call the involuntary frame of prejudice, persecution, or prosecution. They are the groups who most intensely practice and who most need the unofficial community culture that is folklore. Within these oppressive frames grow the queerest and sincerest cries for freedom. Owning your story gives you everything in it. Duncan's tale seems to have circulated within a pretty small circle until a few years ago, but now it's out in the world, as queerly soon as now, as queerly close as here.
Okay, yes, I think we better. Well, thank you so much, Carl. That was wonderful. Um, Christina Bacilega. Uh again, I know that most of you in the room know Christina's work, a uh, specialist in fairy tale scholarship. She teaches at the University of Hawaii. Uh, she's uh, one of our very own. Christina. Thank you, Kay, only for you. Dear Carolyn and all, my first response to your talk, Carolyn, is one of gratitude. Thank you for bringing into the awareness of our now and in ways that further attest to the urgency of the Black Lives Matter movement, another time when devastating loss was actively ignored or covered up by silencing, criminalizing, and dehumanizing lives, non-heteronormative lives in the 1980s. Thank you for opening up a time for remembrance of those who died of AIDS-related illnesses, a remembrance that gathers them with us today, strangers and never forgotten close ones. Thank you for knowing that in performance, folklore is not just the juggling of motifs, but a cultural capital for resistance and also insistence. And thank you for showing us how what I've called activist adaptations are intrinsically symptomatic and critical of their own time as they reach backward into story and play and play it as a discordant tune in our present, a tune that is already resonating with possibilities from and for the future. The other side of my response is to offer something in return and reflect on where your discussion, Carolyn, of queer times in stories and stories in queer time takes me, given my interest in wonder tale adaptations and activist storytelling. What touched me in your observation that, I quote, traditional stories have the power to reveal realities of life that are often felt but have not been attested by scientific measurement or fact-checked histories. While suggesting how fiction tells the truth, this observation may also connect with Ethel Eckerberger's refrain in the first song of Rip Van Winkle, Truth is Stranger Than Fiction. This all converges in the point that, I quote again, the supernatural stratum of the narrative brings out the queer potential of everyday time, or what you call the non-contemporaneity of the now. I'm returned to your assertion in temporalities that, I quote, a history that reckons in the most expansive way with how people exist in time, with what it feels to be a body in time, or in multiple times or out of times, is a queer history for all. Eichelberger's drag adaptation of Rip Van Winkle in 1986 conjures ghosts and specters from different times via irreverent multimedial play that in all seriousness exhibits just how haunted story and history, the moment and place of their performance and the lives of performers and audiences are. Dwelling in an adaptation's multi-anachronistic time, or what you have elsewhere called a temporally plural now, queers the passing of time as chronology and honors the embodied feeling that our now is shored up by many other stories, both memories and imagined futures. I'm no scientist, and neither is Marina Warner, but she recently observed memory and imagination have been considered faculties apart enclosed in different physical parts of the head. Only Leonardo intuited in the drawing of the cross-section of the brain how intertwined they are. Neuroscientists have now discovered that when we conjure up a hypothetical scene, as in writing fiction, we use the same mental regions as when we remember something that happened to us." End of quote. The non-contemporaneity of the now implies that what you term the supernatural has its own materiality and, I agree, can erupt at any moment, refusing to let us forget that unsettling 
wondrous, scary asynchrony of life. This moves me to think about how fairy tales, how the fairy tale is precisely a genre where the asynchrony of life and encounters with the supernatural are presented as wondrous, and also where we can learn, as Kay Turner put it, to, fear, to feel queerly at home in the realm of enchantment. Kay's reading of the Grimm's Frau Holle focuses on the tale's asynchronies, the old Holle and avatar of the mythic Norse Germanic goddess Mother Hulda to show how the time of enchantment, Frau Holle offers the young and oppressed protagonist in her underworld, is a form of mentorship shaped by and shaping a heightened consciousness of queer relational possibilities. Kay writes, for the kind girl and for this queer reader, Frau Holle stands as an ancient figure of hope for the future, end of quote. It's a beautiful and moving essay and it helped me to see how in the fairy tale there is a place and time where wonder and enchantment meet and do not, as I have otherwise discussed in my work, operate in opposition with one another. Caroline's and Kay's comments further move me to think about how narratively a temporally multiple now may produce genre-specific encounters with different wonder beings and bodies and time. When experiencing adaptations of traditional tales, the wondrous beings erupting in our now and the embodied feelings they instigate will vary depending on genre. I, I don't mean this as a rule, but as a hypothesis. If ghosts crowd the Rip Van Winkle scene of adaptations, for the fairy tale, it is all kinds of fairies and witches coming together from different times and places. Fairies like Jin are powerful transformers whose interventions and gifts are better understood in the framework of chance or whimsy, occasionally of justice versus injustice rather than good versus evil. In the tale, recently adapted as an illustrated children's book in Italy, the queen of fairies, Irani, marries the king Solimano, renouncing her fairy privileges and two of her fairy sisters feeling abandoned, plot to have her transformed into a horrid serpent. But the third works her powers to making Irani's happy ending possible. The time of fairies then is also the time of the older fa fata, the mythic fates, that of the spinners, that of the wise women, the Circe-like witches, the Frau Holle and the Hawaiian Pele nature deities, the women, burnt at the stake, returning to populate the streets of Italy in the late 1970s. Tremate, tremate, le streghe son tornate. Living with us as contemporary Wiccans, celebrating at the AFS croning tomorrow night, re-enchanting the world, refusing to vanish into heteronormative domesticity. The once in Once Upon a Time is never just one and an embodied queer awareness of multiplicity, as Carolyn wrote in Temporalities, can serve, and I quote here, to expand, our appre uh, to expand our apprehension and experience of bodies in time, their pleasures, their agonies, their limits, their potentials, to contest and enlarge singular narratives of development. We're still very much in need of contesting such normative development and its entanglements with narrative, especially the fairy tales and plot meant. My final comments bring into our discussion of an extended now, two indigenous visions of and activist interventions in it. A 2015 blog by native Hawaiian scholar and artist, Brian Kamauli Kuwada, and a 2009 short film directed by Sikputlin uh, First Nation director, Helen Haig Brown. Because it contests a colonizing narrative of development that is predicated on their vanishing, the experience of multiple temporalities has its own resonance for indigenous people who are often openly labeled as backward or anachronistic. 
part of the now in Hawaii is a movement to protect the wondrous Mauna Kea mountain from further cultural and environmental desecration by a 30 meter telescope. Within this context, in a blog, Kuwada offers a powerful response to the dismissive declaration that Hawaiians need to stop living in the past and a response to the short-sightedness of a model of progress that sees unrestricted development as the best use of land. Kuwada writes, the future is a realm we, the Hawaiians, have inhabited for thousands of years. You cannot do otherwise when you rely on the land and sea to survive. All of our gathering practices and agricultural techniques are predicated on looking ahead. This ensures that the land is productive into the future, that the sea will be abundant into the future, and that our people will still thrive into the future. This piece is aptly entitled, We Live in the Future. Join us. Kuwada's invitation is a challenge, and Haig Brown's short film applies caution in stressing the responsibility to unlearn, learn, or relearn that it entails. The Cave, that's the title of the film, adapts a story told by her grand, excuse me, by her great uncle, the original recording of which starts the film's audio track while English subtitles run over a black screen. It matters here that Uncle Solomon tells the story as a non-fictional account, something that really happened, that the story has very much a Rip Van Winkle feel, and that the director refers to the cave as the first ever indigenous science fiction film in her native language. The protagonist in cowboy attire with horse and gun is bear hunting. When he crawls into a cave to track the bear, he hits his head and is blinded by an intense blue light. He then comes out of the cave in a different place where he sees a group of native women and men naked or wearing loincloths working together near a stream. He has stumbled into a wondrous encounter. An invisible wall or force field separates them, the, those people, from the native cow cowboy reinforced by the words of a woman. This place is not for you. You are not ready yet. Upon returning to his 1960s Chilcotin world, he finds his horse's dried out skeleton. Is that native scene from the past or the future? Or is it a different temporality? in which the cowboy is at least temporarily denied access. For Anishinaabe scholar Grace Dillon, indigenous science fiction takes the fiction out of science fiction. That is, it roots itself, and here I return with a difference to Carolyn's point about how traditional stories have the power to reveal realities of life. It roots itself in indigenous ways of knowing that have not been attested by scientific measurement or fact-checked history. The film's reticence about the other world honors indigenous literacies and oral tradition without giving them away to those who are not ready to recognize their value or learn from them. As you've written, Carolyn, the experience of multiple temporalities defines life on this earth and is not intrinsically positive. The takeaways for me in reflecting on your queer times and stories and stories in queer times are that activist performances of new old stories may not only expand one's consciousness of the now, but enact an ethics of relation resonant with hope and that heightened attention to the non-contemporaneity of the now is both wondrous and unsettling homework. Thank you. This is great stuff. Uh, I asked that question at the beginning 
what is the value of an old story? And we're getting some amazing answers this evening. Um, Solimar Otero is our final respondent. Um, Soli uh, will bring the ancestors, I think, right now. I'm, deep, I'm deeply honored to be here, and I thank Kane, I thank Carolyn for her work. I am really moved by Carolyn Dinshaw's consideration of the dead and the important role they play in disrupting normative experiences of time in Ethel Eichelberger's Rip Van Winkle. In particular, I like the ways that queer temporalities can make discover discoverable vernacular histories of pain, humor, and dreaming the now. Your consideration of Eichelberger's calling on the dead works as a testimony to the collective trauma caused by the death of beloved friends and family during the AIDS crisis. Like many of the rituals I have experienced in part and participated in in my work on Afro-Cuban religion, Eichelberger is conjuring ancestors through complex performances that are layered in intersubjectivity and intercorporeality. What I love most from the video clips I saw of Eichelberger Eichelberger's Rip Van Winkle is the tap dancing. This embodiment of spontaneous energy and serious fun, as Carolyn would put it, brings home the aesthetics of surprise that queer temporalities allow. The song and dance as embodied moments of the queer now disrupt and reroute the narrative of Rip Van Winkle in deliciously subversive ways reminiscent of the legendary ridiculous theatrical company's camp style. In this regard, serious fun lies akin to Jack Halberstam's silly archives in creating non-normative roadmaps for constructing ourselves in the world. Rip Van Winkle's magic sleep also reminds me of the work that dreaming, imagination, and world making does for creating sites of queer expression. Jose Esteban Munoz's concept of queer potential of the everyday asks us to rework temporality, sensuality, and ephemerality in ways that resonate with how Eichelberger does just that in Rip Van Winkle. Carolyn astutely observes that stories like Rip Van Winkle, when performed by Eichelberger and Nakas, form, quote, walking anachronisms connected to and even inhabited by other times, other places, other people. This is very much the kind of starting points that queer performance art and ritual performances like the Misas Espirituales in Cuban Espiritismo share, the potential to create connections to each other through rhizomatic temporalities, non-material beings, and imagined cartographies. Ghosts are vital to thinking through the embodiment of performances like Eichelberger's Rip and the Misas I study and participate in. In Misas, spirits cohabit with mediums to create deeply meaningful, but also funny and ironic performances. In the spiritual choreography of Espiritismo in Cuba, there is a mixing of high and low culture, the sacred and the body, and the spiritual and the, with the material. My paper on Saturday, Lisita Jose, looks at the importance of humor, much like the gentle haunting Carolyn sees in Eichelberger's ghost, in creating intimacy and kinship between spirit guides and the communities that keep them. Like many Cuban misas, there are also a cacophony of rowdy revenants in Eichelberger's Rip Van Winkle. Spirit guides are often mediums, priests, sorcerers from former lives. Like Jefferson for Eichelberger, creating models of multi-temporal creative work as theater and as ritual, respectively, that includes remaking the now through ancestral remembering. Additionally, the ghost of Hendrik Hudson in Rip reveals a familiar, familiar tendon intimacy between ephemeral beings and material beings that resonates with my own work on spiritual intersubjectivity as queer world-making moments in Espiritismo. And Eichelberger's own feminist critique works by keeping the fictional framing of the narrative, adding Dame Van Winkle as another becoming through performance. Dame Van Winkle's own lack of enthusiasm for the heteronormative prison of their marriage is a much needed perspective that Eichelberger brings to the traditional narrative. For me, these performance practices accent bold, unapologetically inauthentic, and anti-essentialist pairings. Videos can serve as extensions of queer utopian afterlives, and by watching Rip Van Winkle on YouTube and the use of videos in performance. This is also very much like the role that videos can potentially play in communicating spiritual messages to Santeria and Espiritismo's practitioners. Along these lines, the, imag the imagery of queer ancestors like Divine and Mr. Fashion sitting around a table doing the spiritual work of commemorating the great Jack Smith, 
Layer the dead in ways that invoke dense remembering. It is vital for our communities that we imagine these and other ancestors as continuing their creative work through, with, and beside us. The queer temporalities that Dinsha, Dinsha invokes in her talk make it clear that the dead do art in the now and in especially virtual ways. Rites of passage create lineage, communities, and localities based on relational social performances that include the invention of traditions. The trans Latinx and queer traditions of drag, altar making, divination, and casting spells illustrate a continuum of creative kinship making practices that address the interconnected nature of ritual to quotidian practices of place making. Queer kinship relies on the transformative liminality found in the rites of passage. Thus the stage and the altar are two important ritual sites of constitutive queer family making. It is important to note that ritually prepared sites like altares, tronos, and bovedas are essential components, I would even say participants, of Afro-Latinx religious performances. These sites frame liminal spaces where connections to extensive, often ephemeral kin can be developed through multiple performance practices, naming, singing, embodied motion, including dance and material culture. The stage and the altar also mark arenas where performers and practitioners imbue material culture with imagination in a transformative manner that also plays with time. Ethel Eichelberger's Rip Van Winkle does this kin-making work, especially with the dead and through queer time. Queer time is not separate from the kind of Ameri American spiritual imaginary Carolyn sees in the traditional Rip Van Winkle. It is constitutive of alternative versions of temporality that act as an antidote to the regimentation of time that universalism demands. We should be wary of bright futures and progressivisms that hope to dissolve our differences and conflicts. For many times, the vision of the future acts to assimilate, tone down, and silence ourselves for, in the sake for the name of progress, which is usually a process of making ourselves more white, homogeneous, and heteronormative. Rip Van Winkle's bewildered awakening illustrates a snare to wedding politics to a unilinear evolutionary progressivism. He sleeps through the revolution and is liberated by his own experience of magical time and dreaming. This tale of a, a synchrony, especially as performed by both Ethel Eichelberger and Nakas, illustrates that the real revolution is serious fun because it is irreverent with its performance of the non-contemporaneous now. Folklore has long paid attention to how communities create expressive spaces where the hosting of revenants and the bending of time make new worlds that fight more specific notions of time and against homogenization. Here I am thinking of Edward Glissant's own critique of universalism in favor of time and of a more specific idea of time that comes from old traditions of the Caribbean and um, Africa. In similar ways, Eichelberger creates the queer now by, for, and as an ancestor that luxuriously swims in the raucous sea of magical time. I'm just going to have Carolyn come up and say just a little bit of response. I know we're running running late. I want to invite you all to, um, we're having a continuation um, of this conversation, sort of reformatted under the title of uh, the future of um, folk narrative studies uh, internationally. And it will be with Carolyn and Uli Martsoff and um, Kim Lau and others. Um, at starting at 7.15 this evening. So it's a, a way to continue uh, the conversation with Carolyn in a more informal setting. It's a BYOB and the room that we're in is not too far from the bar. Good, so we can partake of the flagon. Well, that was just wonderful. I feel um, I'm so um, overwhelmed by the um, uh, the intelligence and grace um, and spirit of, of these responses. Um, I, f I feel that uh, my work and my, my effort, my gestures have, have been really well understood uh, and that feels just great. So thank you um, so much. I know that we don't have much time, so um, I, I'll just say what strikes me 
beyond that sense that I that I I just think um, I think that just everyone got it right. <laughs> if I had to grade, uh, assign a grade. Um, uh, so I'm I'm very glad um, to hear from Carl about um, what what I was struggling to talk about as the the um, simultaneous folkloric uh, and um, historical um, veracity uh, that Washington Irving was claiming. Um, you explained that in terms of legend and living legend, and I, I just thought that that, um, uh, that was very useful to me to, to know. Um, I love the, um, the focus on the what if um, of the living legend. Um, and of course, your reading of Mallory. Uh, I, I also uh, focusing not only on the uh, the the temporality, but the space, um, the the here ness of of, um, of these living legends. They're not only in the present, but they are they bring us to a kind of expanded space uh, as well. Um, uh, and I love to think of myself as a compulsive storyteller. <laughs> um, Christina, thank you for for um, uh, linking my work. Um, uh, to, uh, uh, it, thinking about um, the HIV/AIDS crisis um, of the '80s um, to something like Black Lives Matter now, um, I, I, you know, I feel unworthy of that that link, um, but I'm. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad that, that you felt the resistant um, uh, strain in what I was trying to, to do. Um, uh, and um, I, uh, I, I really liked your um, uh, uh, focus on, on story in uh, its role in activism. I just thought that that was very, very striking and powerful. Um, and the, the film, The Cave, sounds um, like a powerful Rip Van Winkle um, a tale, uh, expanding um, my uh, understanding of indigenous ways of, of knowing. Um, so I'm very glad to, to know about that and, and, and to, to, to see how much um, I folklorists like yourself are are putting story into political practice uh, seems so important um, and solely thank you for for your comments I, I love the idea that the the dead do art in the now um, I, it just um, I, I know you said that that was what I was saying but I I think you said it, uh, uh, and and it's revealing to me such interesting things about the reading of that video in the video, um, uh, your uh, your reading of YouTube and the importance of, of YouTube. Um, I I was thrilled when I realized that Ethel Eichelberger's um, Rip Van Winkle performance in its entirety is on YouTube because and NYU archives has it, um, um, but at, like um, archives, uh, it's very difficult to, to access, and I didn't think I could even show it, and there it was on YouTube. Uh, so it's such an important um, resource uh, for, for everyone. I think I'll, I'll stop there so that if, if there's time, we can have some questions from, from the floor. Especially with the performance.
Sharp, um, uh, and Madam Van Van Winkle, is uh, how drag performance can actually question um, misogyny, especially to the founding misogyny in American literature. Um, and I thought, well, maybe could you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that that, given, I mean, and, and this is an older book by Halberstam, and maybe um, they've changed their opinion of that um, statement on drag, which I think was very pointed um, within the, an argument within the chapter, but um, I don't know if you could respond to that. Yeah, that's a, the, it's a great question, and, and um, it's making me uh, understand something in the um, in Eichelberger's performance itself, because um, you probably noticed that in that interchange, uh, in which Eichelberger is is playing both Rip and uh, Dame Van Winkle, Dame Van Winkle has the lower voice, um, and and it's Rip with this kind of high squeaky performed voice, uh, and so I I just think that's really. Um, powerful and interesting uh, as a choice. Um, and I think it, I, if I understood your comment, um, I think that that's what's happening. That it's, it's a, a person in drag, um, a man in drag, um, playing a woman, but not, not playing for laughs, as, as he said, but, and, and not um, doing a kind of stereotypical femininity at all. Um, but really, um, in that in that um, sequence, I think it's Dame Van Winkle who is the larger than life figure right at that that moment. So so I think um, pointing to the 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 ways that drag can question um, uh, and, and camp um, uh, can can actually question misogynist traditions um, is is. Um, helpful in understanding the choices that Eichelberger made there. So thank you.